Hello everyone, good evening. This is Dr. Karen Sullivan back with you for another I Care For Your Brain lecture. In the last few weeks, we have been doing something called an article review where I go through the literature on a specific brain health topic and report back to you everything that I found. And this is based on one of the foundational beliefs of I Care For Your Brain, which is that if your brain health providers know something, I want you as a person out there living with it, a person out there who cares about someone living with it, to understand it as well. We actually had a milestone today. We reached 4,000 followers on our Facebook page, and that just is so exciting because it really means that we're fulfilling the mission of doing this, which is to really reach as many people as possible to empower them with science-based brain health information. I was motivated to do this because I was afraid that the loudest voice in the brain health arena online was coming from corporations who are trying to sell you a product. And of course they can't be objective in almost every instance because of the sales pitch. So I really wanted to be able to come to you on a regular basis with information that you could trust, that was interesting, that was informative, and would really make a difference in the way that you think about whatever brain health challenge you have. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about Parkinson's once again. The Parkinson's community has always impressed me, and in fact, if you are in the world of neuroscience, Everyone, scientists, clinicians, we all really speak very highly of the PD community because y'all are very interested in what's going on, very informative, tend to be um, very strong advocates, wanting to be involved with research and really, really good communicators. So it's always a thrill to be able to speak with you guys directly. So last week I actually talked about another movement disorder called essential tremor. And there's some overlap with PD in the sense that we're finally, finally, finally recognizing that this is a multi-system disorder. This is not just a tremor disorder, that we have physical, sensory, cognitive, and emotional symptoms because this is how the brain works. The brain does almost everything in triplicate, and so we've always got symptoms within the physical, sensory realm, cognitive realm, and emotional realm. It's just up to us to be able to validate those symptoms and to categorize them and understand them. So within the world of Parkinson's, we finally know that there are non-motor symptoms, and we've talked about this in other lectures. And what we're gonna talk about tonight is really moving the focus in Parkinson's away from the central nervous system and over to the peripheral nervous system. And we're gonna talk about a transition from dopamine over to another type of a molecule called alpha-synuclein. And these two things together make up our topic tonight. So what we're gonna be talking about is the gut and we're gonna be talking about this alpha-synuclein or A-synuclein and you're gonna learn all about it. You're gonna learn about what the current thinking is and how the gastrointestinal system relates to Parkinson's and ideas for future treatment. So for many people, about 20 years before they start to develop a tremor, the very first symptom is a slowing down of the gastrointestinal tract. And remember, this goes along with this wisdom of what we can see manifest physically in neurological disorders often is happening in parallel in other symptoms. So here we have eventually some slowing of the muscles, the movement system, and what we're seeing even decades before, typically even 20 years before, is a slowing down of the motility of the gut. So for many people, constipation is when they look back and they say, you know, knowing what I know now about my PD, that was really the first place that it started. But the gut PD connection actually goes all the way back to about 200 years ago when the guy who named Parkinson's disease, James Parkinson's, um, started to make observations in his writing that people with PD very often had constipation. And in fact, we think about half of the people who have Parkinson's um, really started off with this as their very first symptom. But yet, over the last 200 years, you know, we've kind of lost our way with that line of thinking and we've really focused a lot on the brain. But now this is starting to get widened out. So we have previously talked about the modern day concept of how PD progresses. And so basically, just a brief review, is the way when I was being trained, you know, even 10, 15 years ago, was that there was a loss of dopaminergic neurons in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. And this 
creates the black substance of dopamine. During the ending of my training, going to maybe seven, eight years ago, I started to hear that, no, actually there's a step before that and the problems start in the brainstem. And that was kind of cutting edge. And now what we're doing is taking a step back even further and saying, huh, it seems like there's some other systems changes that are happening even before we get into the brain. And so this is what we're gonna talk about tonight. So remember I said we're gonna shift focus in terms of location from brain to gut, and we're gonna shift focus on the molecule from dopamine to alpha-synuclein. So I thought a good place to start would be to tell you more about this alpha-synuclein. What exactly is this? So to date, we have thought that something called Lewy bodies in brain cells is the hallmark of Parkinson's disease. Well, in the middle of a Lewy body, right in the center there is this alpha-synuclein, and this is a misshapen protein that's made up of about 140 amino acids, and we call this alpha-synuclein, or some people call it asynuclein for short. Now, in a healthy body, we think that alpha-synuclein is related to a healthy immune response. And in fact, some of the data I'm gonna share with you tonight suggests that all of us have some of this asynuclein. The problem becomes when our systems get overloaded, when we get too much of this molecule, and it starts to change shape. That's very, very critical because we have many different types of alpha-synuclein, but when we get into it becoming problematic or pathological in terms of Parkinson's disease, it's because it's gotten kind of shrunken and misshapen, and that's when it really does its damage. So the thinking that we're gonna talk about tonight is what happens when this alpha-synuclein actually starts to collect and form and spread from the gut. And I'm gonna share with you some research tonight saying that maybe the appendix is actually the origin of where this starts to all go wrong. And the idea is that it goes from being its normal healthy shape, like I said, into kind of a misshapen protein. And then instead of staying in its little home where it's supposed to be, where the immune system can work and do all its jobs, it actually starts spreading into different body systems. So even though 200 years ago we were talking about the gut and the brain, it basically got lost for a long time until about 2003 when a researcher in Germany named Dr. Brock, B-R-A-A-K, proposed that Parkinson's might actually start in the gut. And this was so radical. This is like 15 years ago. But what he did is he did a series of autopsy studies where he looked at uh, the brains and the gastrointestinal si systems of people with Parkinson's. And what he found is that these people had more of this alpha-synuclein in their gut when you had PD as opposed to when you didn't. But maybe even more compelling is that the more advanced the person's PD was, the more of this alpha-synuclein they had in their stomach. So that's that dose-dependent relationship that we talk about in science showing that the more symptomatic someone is, if there's a certain pathology that's supposed to be related to it, then we should also see more of that, right? It makes sense. So basically this researcher started to get this idea on the map by speculating that maybe something that was unidentified enters into the system, kind of sets up shop in the stomach. And this Dr. Brock started talking about that the path of travel from the gut to the brain was the vagus nerve. And this is a bundle of fibers that connects a lot of different body organs together, but basically all joins up in the brainstem, which comes directly from the spinal cord. So this was kind of like the pathway that gets the problems from the gut up into the brain. And this idea has really been gaining traction to the point now where this is, if you go to an international Parkinson's conference, this is the, 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 the talks that are gonna be sold out. This is the stuff that brain scientists really want to know about, clinicians really wanna know about. And there's a lot of active investigations, there's a lot of unanswered questions, but I want you to be understanding the conversation that's saying, taking place. I'm not able to give you definitives tonight because the field just doesn't know, but I think that this is cutting edge to the point where there's enough data to support that they're on the right track. And the, the basic idea that's accepted now is the idea that brain abnormalities are absolutely driving Parkinson's disease, but that it's probably setting up in the gut before we actually start to see the clinical disorder. And really there's three different mechanisms that scientists are talking about. So one I already told you is that this alpha-synuclein moves from the intestines through the vagus nerve to the brain. 
The next one is that the gut is influencing something happening in the brain through inflammation. And the other one is that there's some kind of byproduct that's happening from bacterial breakdown in the gut um, that is uh, causing some other type of unknown biological reaction to happen. So I looked at this literature to share with you tonight and I wanna tell you some of the more compelling things that I found. So there's a group of scientists at the University of Oklahoma Health Center and they have spent nine years researching a part of the intestine where there's usually very little alpha-synuclein. So this is a part called the duodenum. And what they did is they looked at 42 children who had significant gastrointestinal issues like pain, diarrhea, vomiting, and gut inflammation where you could actually look under a microscope and say, wow, this child was having a gastrointestinal crisis. So what they found is that when these kids were having gastrointestinal issues and the more inflamed it was, the more of this alpha-synuclein that they found and they were not finding it in healthy children in as much of an abundance, okay? One of the keys that I wanna tell you is it's not like alpha-synuclein is just in the Parkinson's gut. It's in all of our systems, but what is unique about the person that then goes on to develop these misfolded proteins that start the cascade of Parkinson's, okay? So um, this was interesting that when gastrointestinal symptoms arose due to some kind of infection, we're seeing more alpha-synuclein. So that's, that's one of the keys to this puzzle. Last year, there was a scientist at Georgetown University that reported that after a child was exposed to the norovirus, that again, this alpha-synuclein increased and it did not in children that were not exposed to the virus. So there's something about a viral exposure and alpha-synuclein increasing. The other thing that they found was that when you put these alpha-synuclein molecules into a lab dish, that it attracted an immune response. So basically the way they're kind of thinking of it is it's almost like a magnet, like something goes wrong within the gut the alpha-synuclein calls in all of these other immune cells, and the idea is from there, something must be kind of growing and flourishing. The way that abnormal pathological asynuclein travels throughout the body is it's literally cell to cell. There's something that happens where it's almost kind of like catchy, and in a chain, it grows throughout the body. So we know that alpha-synuclein, one of the things that it does is it's kind of like a magnet for this inflammatory cell. So together the idea is that the production of asynuclein in the gut wall is really thought to be a cause of gut inflammation and not necessarily effect, okay? So what they wanted to do was of course look in people that had a genetic predisposition for Parkinson's versus people that didn't. And what they found when they did this was that folks who had a family history, a very high um, genetic load for making too many copies of this alpha-synuclein basically had an inability to clear it effectively from their body. And I thought this was really interesting because this is actually a very similar hypothesis that's happening in Alzheimer's disease. So the idea with Alzheimer's is we have these plaques and tangles and they build up in the brain and they basically suffocate brain cells from the inside and on the outside. And the idea is we actually all have plaques and tangles, but those of us that don't develop Alzheimer's disease have a mechanism in our brain through our brain's immune system where we can actually cleave it, cut it, and the immune system can move it out so it never gets a chance to build up. And what I'm reading in the Parkinson's literature is very similar, but as it relates to this asynuclein. And so we all have it, but something happens in the PD gut where it just basically grows and grows. And then the idea is it's got to go somewhere because it doesn't have enough um, real estate to basically take up all the different slots. So the idea is that one hypothesis is that repeated acute or chronic gut infections might be the trigger that starts off this process in PD. So within the world of bacterial infections, this could include things like salmonella, various E. coli infections. Within the world of viral infections, these are things like your basic stomach flu. So one of the future uh, research directions is to start to look at people with a family history of PD and see if they have a history of more gastrointestinal viruses. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, so this 
ties into another line of research that is looking at the gut uh, microbe environment of people who actually have Parkinson's disease. And it's thought to be pretty significantly different than people who do not have Parkinson's disease. And so, you know, I've often talked to you guys about this, that a lot of times within one clinical disorder, we look to see what has been done in other clinical disorders once that body system is implicated. So one of the things I keep reading about now is, you know, how is it that we treat other types of repetitive gastrointestinal infections? And so there's people that have chronic um, C. diff. So these, are, unfortunately, are a lot of times hospital-born illnesses. And if somebody is in the hospital a lot, you know, they're elderly, they're prone to being sick, a lot of times people can get C. diff and it can cause really chronic disabling diarrhea. So in the last few years, more and more people are getting fecal transplants, also called a stool transplant. And the first time I heard of it, I was definitely surprised, definitely curious. But in fact, what they do is they empty the unwell person of all of the waste that's in their body and they get a donor who gives over their uh, contents of their gastrointestinal system and they put it into the unwell person. And the idea is that all the healthy bacteria, all the flora that's in that healthy stool will actually be absorbed by the person's gastrointestinal tract and they will be able to finally uh, be healed of some of their chronic stomach issues. So people are starting to talk about, you know, is this a viable option for people who are at risk for Parkinson's? I'd love to know what you guys think about that. So last month I reviewed an article called Triggers, Facilitators, and Aggravators, Redefining PD Pathogenesis, and we talked about this work as a new conceptual model for how Parkinson's developed, and this author divided things into triggers, facilitators and aggravators. So triggers are things or events that begin the very first steps that begin a disease process. Um, facilitators are things that allow the disease to spread into the central nervous system. So according to this theory, the triggers would be some kind of um, infection, some kind of foreign invader in the gastrointestinal tract and the immune system response. And the facilitator would be the traveling of the pathological asynuclein through the vagus nerve up to the brain. Um, so um, going even deeper within this line of research, um, now within gastrointestinal people are starting to talk about the appendix specifically. So I looked at an article that came out just a few months ago from Wayne State University and it's called The Appendix Impacts the Risk for Developing Parkinson's. And the appendix is interesting because, you know, the way that we have thought about it is that it's kind of this, um, this, you know, uh, something that's from the past that doesn't really seem to help us anymore. And it's, it's kind of been dismissed. You know, we don't need it anymore. It's a vestige from the past. But we're actually starting to think that it has a role in the immune system and that this may contribute to a person's chances of getting PD. So what is the appendix? It's kind of like this little finger tube that has no ending that is a little bit of a pouch between the colon and it's between the junction of the small and the large intestine. So what they talked about was in the research lab that, um, that the appendix has been shown in people who just before they've been diagnosed with PD and people who actually have PD, that they have an abundance of this alpha synuclein within their appendix, okay? And um, there has been a couple different studies looking at how people who had an appendectomy in childhood or young adulthood compare to people who went on to develop PD. So let me just tell you about that quickly. So there was one study where they looked at two data sets, two data sets, and one was from something called the Swedish National Patient Registry. And this is a fascinating data set because it actually includes uh, health information 
from every person that was ever born or lived in Sweden from 1964 on. So this is actually over 1,698,000 people. So they've got everything that ever happened to these people in terms of their health. So the first thing they did was figure out who of all these people had their appendix taken out. And this was about 550,000 people. Then they identify how many of these people went on to develop Parkinson's and it was about 2,252. Then of course they could do statistics and figure out, well, what was the risk of getting PD if you did have an appendix or if you had it taken out? And what they found is that if you had your appendix taken out, your risk for developing Parkinson's went down by 19.3%. And on average, in the folks that did get PD, there was a bit of a delay in the onset of the symptoms by about 1.6 years, okay? Then they actually um, looked at the tissue under a microscope of people who had PD, people did not have PD, and they kind of got thrown a curveball because what they found was that everybody had a lot of alpha-synuclein in their appendix. These are even people who are under the age of 20 years old, but the difference was the amount, okay? So in PD, it was a lot, lot, lot higher. So what they wanted to do was look at the PD group and say, was there any way we could split these folks according to different demographics that we know increase someone's chance of getting Parkinson's? So one of the things that we've known for a long time is that where you live, in your childhood, in your teenage years, in your young adulthood, has a lot to do with your risk of going on to develop PD. And the way we split it is between rural and urban. And I wonder if you can guess what the difference is between those two groups. If you are a well-informed PD person, you know that the answer is pesticides, right? People that live in rural environments tend to have much higher exposure to pesticides. So what they did is they broke up the folks that they took everybody who had had an appendectomy within the PD um, population and what they found is that if you lived in a rural environment and you had your appendix out, your chances of developing PD went down by almost 26%. So not only, and we didn't see this kind of benefit at all in people who live in urban areas, okay? So what this tells us is not only does getting your appendix taken out in childhood reduce your risk, it reduces it even more if you're more likely to have a pesticide exposure, okay? So this is really, really, really interesting stuff. And in these folks, if you live rurally and you had an appendectomy, your onset of PD was significantly more delayed, now this time up by about 3.6 years on average. So this is pretty significant. So the idea is that the appendix is kind of the site of kickoff. That's kind of how I'm starting to think about it. So it's a trigger, and once the pathological process starts, then we kind of leave the appendix behind and we move through the vagus nerve and up to the brain. So obviously, what are the therapeutic implications of this? This is a big deal. This is going from thinking something is starting in this brain that's very hard to access. Not only do you got the skull to get through, but never forget about the blood-brain barrier. It makes it really hard for therapeutic molecules to get in there. That's why it's so hard to treat our brain health challenges is because we can't just take a pill or put something in our bloodstream and assume it's going to get into the brain. We've got these guards that stand watch to make sure nothing bad enters. So what they've been doing is they're starting to look at targeting asynuclein instead of dopamine. And there's actually, um, within the world of cancer treatment, there's been a couple different um, drugs that have been approved that they're starting to think about with um, Parkinson's disease. An obvious, uh, implication would be, well, should we be suggesting preventative appendectomies to people who are at risk? And the researchers say, absolutely not. Even for at-risk individuals, we just don't know enough. But you know, one of the things I pride myself on doing is extrapolating practical implications and can-dos for you from scientific journal articles. So what I think is that this helps us understand is that in people who are watching who have PD, you now know your kids, your grandkids are at increased risk. They're not guaranteed to get PD, but I know many of you are out there wanting to make sure you can do everything possible to reduce their risk. So one thing is to try to reduce the instances of intestinal infections. So considering a high quality 
probiotic, you know, not only for yourself, but maybe your children, your grandchildren. Um, this certainly uh, opens up the idea of these fecal transplants for people with early stage PD. Um, there are five companies now who are conducting clinical trials to actually look at um, antibody treatment of ACE and nucleon. So what can we do to reduce the fact that these proteins will become misshapen and then also kind of aggregate, come together, and then move throughout from the peripheral to the central nervous system. So the latest information that I could find was that there is a stage two trial happening, and this is very hopeful because you have to go through stage one where you prove safety and tolerability. And many different drugs don't get through stage one. So once we get to stage three, two, we actually know that we're on to something. So they have passed phase one. This is called the Pasadena study, and this is from a company called Prothena. And they're basically a biotech company who focuses on novel therapies. And so right now they're doing a multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study to look at the actual efficacy, the effectiveness of a drug over about the course of a year in folks that have early stage Parkinson's. And this is really exciting because it's a whole new target. We've been focused so long on dopamine, and now here we are actually getting to the underneath, the thing that might be kicking it all off to begin with. So I think it's a really exciting time. I know that many of you out there would love to be involved in these clinical trials. The best source of information that I found is the Michael J. Fox Foundation, so going on there and actually looking around and seeing if any availability is in your area. The connection between the gut um, and the brain always, uh, we have to take into account inflammation. That's probably the bridge that really connects these two things. So I talked to you about this before. It, at your primary care doctor, you can ask for a marker of overall body inflammation called a C-reactive protein. That's a very standard part of a blood test where you can monitor your overall body inflammation. But you can also make diet and lifestyle changes that will help you reduce inflammation. So we've talked about this before, that things like high cholesterol, processed food, insulin resistance, low testosterone, uh, obesity, diabetes, all of these things dramatically increase the amount of inflammation in our body, including in our brain. I think that it would be good common sense to include a probiotic if you're somebody living with PD now, just to make sure that the flora in your gut microbiome is as good as it can be. Of course, eating as many organic plant foods as you possibly can is the good old fashioned way of making sure you have good and healthy bacteria. Being really good about trying to reduce your sugar is very important. This is not the easiest time of year to do that. However, it is always a good reminder to just try to get a little bit better and better every time. So I thought that this was a very interesting new line of research. It's definitely brand new. We of course need a lot more studies. We need a lot more people to participate in those studies, but it's really rewarding for me and I hope it is for you to see that finally we're making some advancements. We're starting to really uh, validate the non-motor symptoms that go along with different movement disorders. I mean, so many of you have been told that, no, that can't possibly be related to PD or ET. And then sure enough, a couple of years down the road, we figure out that it can be. So I want you to be as informed as you can possibly be. So I hope that this was interesting to you, maybe gave you a little bit of food for thought on how to empower yourself or somebody that you know with this information. So next week is Christmas week. I will not be here, but the week after that, I'm actually gonna be talking about this Alzheimer's vaccine. I had somebody send me an email and ask me my opinion. And the first thought I had is, well, if I'm not hearing about it in scientific circles, it's probably not the most legitimate thing. Then I started to do a little bit of research and I can see that it's getting talked about in mainstream media with a lot more promise than unfortunately I think is really there. So as I've told you guys, when I do these lectures, I'm kind of carving out time in my schedule to actually focus on the research so I can bring you the legit real deal. So that's exactly what I'll be doing uh, amongst other things over my Christmas break and I will report back to you the week after. So if you thought that this was helpful or interesting, I would love for you to share it, especially on any PD Facebook groups. There's so many people out there that are just dying for information and I would love for them to be able to get it from a good objective source.
Thank you guys so much for listening. I love being here with you and I hope you have a great holiday. Thank you guys so much. Bye-bye.